seeming like a supernatural presence in the room. And he, he, he can't get over it. He goes back into the dream. Again, he tries to wake, and suddenly he wakes up. And there is a man dressed as a traveling German professor, perhaps, dressed very, very well, sitting in front of him, uh, sitting on a chair with his two hands upon a walking stick, and Raskolnik, of course, pretends as if he doesn't, maybe this is a hallucination, maybe this is the devil, what is this? He opens his eyes, and again the man is sitting there. Suddenly, he sits straight up and says, who are you anyway? And the man, not at all flustered, not at all bothered by the tone that uh, Raskolnikov takes, says, uh, allow me uh, to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov. You remember Svidrigailov in the letter from the mother. Here is that terrible man whom Raskolnikov considered, on the basis of the letter from the mother, the corrupter of Dunya, the, cor the corrupter of his uh, sister, and the source of a tremendous amount of nastiness in this novel. This is the face of the old lecher that I talked about, you remember, in uh, Poor Folk, uh, the, the first example of whom you got in a much cleaner man by the name of Djevushkin. This is a man who represents a tremendous amount of evil, uh, a lecher, uh, a card sharp, uh, a murderer, because it seems that he might well have murdered his own wife. And this is Svidri Gail. Raskolnikov is virtually speechless. How would you dare come to a place like mine? He said, oh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's something in common between you and me. Said, no, no, there's nothing in common. There's absolutely nothing that you and I could possibly... Oh, no, he said, tell me, uh, do you sometimes see ghosts? You remember the dream that Raskolnikov had. He said, you must be a sick man. You, you were hallucinating and seeing ghosts. He said, oh, I know. They say that uh, those who see ghosts are sick people, and the ghosts are hallucinations of a sick imagination. But you know, there's some logic to that, of course. But there's an equal logic to say, well, ghosts really exist. You simply have to be sick to see them. After all, what could be more natural? Sick people are much closer to the other world. Uh, well people are, are furthest away from the other world. So it's quite logical that uh, sick people would be the ones who'd be privileged to see the ghost. So have to think about that for a while and see how well you sleep in the evening. And then they go on to talk about eternity. Uh, Svidrigailov says, suppose eternity is nothing but a Russian bathhouse that's dried up with cobwebs in the corner. And of course, <laughs> this view, this bleakness the view of eternity, uh, fits in very well with the world that Raskolnikov has built for himself, estranged from the whole world because of the terrible crime he's committed and because of uh, his notions about being a superior person, about being a Napoleon. It's equivalent to that uh, empty, dusty uh, bathhouse with cobwebs in the corner. Raskolnikov is forced to recognize, of course, in this particular part of the novel, subconsciously, that there is indeed something in common between him and Svidrigailov. And, of course, we, very well, we now very well understand that Svidrigailov is that evil side of Raskolnikov representing it very well. At that point, Raskolnikov remembers that he had made a promise to Sonia, the daughter of Marmiladov, who had uh, died after an accident on the street. He had promised to visit her because you remember he had left some coins uh, for the children. They saw him as a kind of a benefactor. And so there's a famous scene where Raskolnikov goes to the room of Sonia and tries to understand who is she, uh, what, what enables her to be the noble kind of a person who would sacrifice her entire life to help her own family, which as a matter of fact may die very soon. And of course, what will she do? What will the children do when the mother dies? Sonia says, no, 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 they, they couldn't suffer when my mother dies. God will take care of them. I believe in God. God will see them. And Raskolnikov turned and looks at her and he says, uh, and suppose there is no God? This deeply upsets Sonia. She, she virtually attacks him physically and says, no, you mustn't talk like that. That's impossible to think that way. There must be a God. There is a God. I won't listen to you. And Raskolnikov thinks to himself, she must be mad. There must be some kind of illness, almost insanity in her case. It's interesting that he had been... Uh, previously uh, betrothed to the daughter of the landlady in his apartment. And at one point he said, I don't know why I was attracted to her. Perhaps I was attracted to her by the very fact that she was ill, that she was sick. And of course, that seems to say something about Sonia in the novel. This 
angelic character whom Dostoevsky presents is nevertheless perhaps sick. Perhaps there's some kind of sickness here. Dostoevsky plays with this in the world of Raskolnikov, and you, you begin to realize how the human mind works, how the human spirit works. He taunts her, and of course she gets extremely upset, and she, she tries very, very hard to make him understand what it means to have faith. And all of a sudden, when she talks about the, the possible fate of her, uh, of her siblings, of her younger siblings, Raskolnikov falls to the ground and kisses her feet. And of course, here you see absolutely both sides of Raskolnikov. You see that part that really does have something in common with Svidrigailov. Really does, ha does have something deeply evil. And on the other hand, someone who can deeply appreciate decency and faith as Dostoevsky sees it. At one point, he asks her to read from the New Testament, and she reads about the resurrection of Lazarus. And of course, you get that scene where it says, on smrdjit, that's Old Church Slavonic. He, he stinketh, as it's translated in the New Testament in the King James edition, to make the point that he really is dead, and now he's resurrected. And in, uh, in trying to see that Lazarus is, is resurrected in the scene in the New Testament, they have to roll away the stone. Now, of course, that's very important for Dostoevsky. Raskolnikov had buried the money that he had stolen under a stone. And just as that stone had to be rolled away from Lazarus' tomb, so the stone would eventually have to be rolled away from the place that he had done the money. There's an implication there, of course, of resurrection and of salvation, even for a criminal like uh, Raskolnikov. At the end of the scene, we suddenly realize that somebody has set up a chair in the apartment next to where this is all going on. That somebody, of course, he set up a chair so he could put his ear more comfortably against the wall and listen to what was going on. That somebody was Svidrigailov. And we suddenly realize that Svidrigailov now has a very good hint of what's bothering Raskolnikov, uh, of, uh, uh, of who committed that crime. Uh, Svidrigailov uses this to go to Dunya, the sister, and to get her to see him. But before he can do that, Katerina Ivanovna, as has been the Katerina Ivanovna, the, the, mother of, uh, uh, the mother of Sonia and the mother of the children, has sort of gone out of her mind. And because she can't get any money, she dresses the children up in costumes and pushes them out on the street where they have to sing the song, Ma Bresson va ton guerre. Uh, uh, as for all passers-by. Of course, the passers-by who see this terrible scene, this grotesque and comic scene, uh, don't know what the devil is going on. The, the kids are terrified with the, when people are falling. They try to run away. Uh, Katerina Ivanova runs after them, trips over a stone, falls, knocks her head against the stone, and realizes that she's going to die. The prediction that Raskolnikov made in the apartment of Sonia has come to pass. Uh, she really is going to die, and here the children are left hopeless. And at that moment, who should step in but Svidrigailov, telling them, of course he's been following Raskolnikov, telling him, look, don't worry, I'll take care of these children, I'll put several thousand rubles in trust for each one of them, and they'll be taken care of. Of course, Raskolnikov is tremendously shocked that Svidrigailov, of all people, would do something like this. Uh, people are very complicated in Dostoevsky. They don't have just one side. And of course, that too also puts him in parallel, as he said before, with Raskolnikov, because Raskolnikov had done something exactly comparable to that in leaving his last coins for those uh, people when he had visited the house of Marmuladov. The, the psychology gets very complicated and very penetrating. At this point, Svidrigailov insists that he wants to see Dunya. Uh, Raskolnikov, of course, will not let him get anywhere near Dunya because of the reputation of what he's done before, but he manages to catch her on the street. And of course, she, she greets him with revulsion. He says, look, I know something very important about your brother. I'm going to tell you something about your brother. This is for his benefit. And of course, she's willing to sacrifice herself to the extent for her brother to even go with Svidrigailov. And he gets her to come to his apartment where he locks the door. And he tells her the business about the murder. She can hardly believe it. But he says, look, I can arrange it so he can get away. I can arrange it so he won't be subject to justice. But you'll have to do something for me first. And she realizes that he's trapped her in this room for very nasty purposes. Essentially, uh, he's, he's, he's ready to rape her. She, she accuses him of rape. He says, look, uh, this uh, Ms. Raskolnikova, rape is a very hard thing to prove. A very 
that is so nasty that finally she pulls out a gun, a gun which, as a matter of fact, he had given her when she was on his estate earlier, uh, earlier events in the novel. She said, take a step toward me and I'll shoot. He said, oh, if that's the case, that's just what I want. I was planning a trip to America. And you begin to realize what the trip to America was. And he takes a step and she shoots and only grazes his head. And of course, there's this, a flesh wound of blood that comes in the top. He said, oh, I see you were aiming at my head. Well, that's interesting. He takes another step and she shoots again. And this time, barely missing him. He says, that's all right. Take your time. Reload. I'll keep on coming. And she realizes this time that if she shoots again, she really will kill him. And she makes a decision quite different from the decision of her brother. She drops the pistol. She refuses to kill a human being, even an evil human being. And of course, in the contest of wills, in the contest of pride, you realize that it's Dunya who is the stronger one. In spite of Raskolnikov's diabolical pride, his sister is even more powerful. Svitigailov, too, understands this. And quickly, he opens where he says, Quick, go, get out of here. A storm is brewing over St. Petersburg, and you realize that you're coming to the last moments of Svitigailov. Uh, he picks up the pistol, puts it in his pocket, and goes to a terrible, ratty hotel in the city of Petersburg, where Dostoevsky takes us through a series of nightmares, of terrible nightmares. And you realize that if anybody understands the nature of dreams, it's Dostoevsky. And of course, all of these dreams are centered around his uh, sensuality. He sees uh, what looks like a French harlot in a, in a coffin, who suddenly wakes up from the coffin and starts laughing at him, starts uh, appealing for him to come to her. Uh, he comes to her and he suddenly wakes up. And as he wakes up, of course, he hears somebody bullying a friend of his in the other room. And then he goes back to sleep. And when he goes back to sleep again, he sees these terrible sensual images. And he doesn't know what to do. He's tortured in sleep. He's tortured awake. The skies have burst in Petersburg. There's a terrible rain going on. And you understand, this is the first time in the novel that there's been a rain. It's summertime, and it's been very hot and very dusty in Petersburg. And all of a sudden, there's a rain, clearly a rain of redemption. Dostoevsky has brought a reign of redemption into the novel at a time when, when Svidrigailov is at his worst and is most troubled. Finally, Svidrigailov can stand it no longer. He goes out into the square and begins to put the gun to his head. And at this point, a rather curious scene occurs in the novel. He's being observed by a man who's talking in clearly a very heavy uh, Jewish accent, uh, a Jewish fellow with a strange uh, cask on his head. And Dostoevsky identifies him as a Jew. He says, hey, hey wait a minute, uh, in, a, in a rather heavy accent, he says, you can't do that here. You can't do that here. This is not the place. He says, well, brother, it's, it's quite all right. I'm only going to America. And of course, as with his Jew is a, is a witness, he shoots himself. And of course, this has something to do with Dostoevsky's attitude toward the Jews. This would come up at a, t at a time like that. Well, Raskolnikov has been convinced by Sonia that he should go and confess the crime. He goes to the police station, of course the police have been keeping an eye on him, and he wants, he, he wants to say something, but he can't do it. He suddenly leaves the police station. As he leaves, he hears that Svidrigailov has committed suicide, and now clearly he's free to do it. He comes back into the station and says, it was I who killed. Uh, Dostoevsky uh, has an epilogue where he has the resurrection of Raskolnikov. Whether or not this is believable is something that, uh, that critics have argued about uh, to a great extent and very, very fiercely. But the real uh, solution of this problem will come in the novels that we'll be talking about in the next lectures.